Good morning, church. Uh, as ever, it is so wonderful uh, to, to see you today. Uh, a round of applause for the pastor's wife. <laughs> it's a privilege, isn't it? <laughs> Henry Christ. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, and again, I'll also come to the Lord in prayer because we can't do nothing without the Spirit. Um, Holy Spirit, we pray that you fill me for this moment. You will prepare me for such a time as this. Amen. Uh, so today might be a bit heavier than usual, but uh, it's not by design, it's just... Um, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Uh, two years ago, I was in tears uh, on the M18 in the motorway chasing an ambulance. You see, in that ambulance was my son. And my son was in a very bad way. And I remember praying these words. Lord, please may you spare this child's life. And I cried, I cried as I chased that ambulance. It's really fast. Couldn't catch up. But I cried those because my son's life was at risk. And God heard my prayer. God heard the prayers of so many people who were praying at that moment. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. This poor man cried, and God delivered him. God is so gracious. God is so kind. And I know you know that experience when God has come through for you in a mighty way, in a miraculous way, that all you want to do is to praise him and to thank him. We've had so many testimonies from this platform of what God has done. That citizenship came through. That child you're asking for came through. That spouse you're asking for came through. That job came through. That interview, you aced it and you passed it. That exam, you passed it. God comes through. But I think maybe something that we do not speak about as often is when those prayers are not answered. You seek the Lord, and seemingly the answer is no. You pray for that loved one, but they pass away. Your health is deteriorating. About 10 years ago, again in a similar scenario, I prayed the same prayer. I was at work, got a phone call. Your wife is in hospital. Rushed to the hospital, was in the cab, again praying the same prayer. Lord, please spare these children. My wife was pregnant with twins, and I prayed that prayer again with tears in my eyes. And God did not answer that prayer in the way that I asked for it. In those moments, what are you to do? What are you to do when God doesn't answer prayer the way you've asked for it? When God does not spare your children? What do you do? Do you stop praying? That's not an option. That is disobedient because God said pray. But you just pray little prayers. But what does the Bible say? You have not because you do not ask. 
So what do you do when you have that corridor of uncertainty? You see, when you don't pray, at least you don't get disappointed because it's the hope that kills you. But when you pray, you're opening up the two possibilities, right? God will intervene and answer in a miraculous way and you'll be up here saying testimonies. But you're also opening up the uncertainty. You're also opening up the possibility that God is going to say no. And you're going to be heartbroken. How, what's that going to do to your faith? Is your faith going to sustain such hurt and disappointment? You ask for healing. It does not come. You ask for persecution to stop. It does not stop. You ask for those bullies to stop and they do not stop. You ask for the ill treatment to stop and it does not stop. And you cry out to God. You seek out for God. But seemingly, he does not answer. What are you to do? Today, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, we get some clues of what are we going to do when our prayers don't get answered as we hope. And when I say prayers not answered, I'm talking from your vantage point, from your point of view. You're praying for one thing and that thing does not happen. What are you going to do? So in Daniel chapter 3, I'll read some verses and I'll retell the story. So what had happened was Israel was in exile in Babylon. And the king there, by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, he put up this massive gold statue, about six double-deckers high. And he asked for people to bow down to the statue. He wanted to unify his kingdom under one God, him. So he issues out this decree. So I'm going to read from... Verses 3. So Daniel chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. So the satraps, the prefects, the magistrates, and all the other provincial, provincial officials assembled for the dedication of an image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. Soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lighter, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown in a blazing furnace. Options are simple. Bow down or burn. Your choice. This is what you're to do. But some Jews refused. They refused to bow down. And amongst them were these young guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you read this in verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you have said, so people are now reporting that there are some Jews who are now bowing down. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of God you have set up. And at this the king was furious. Rage engulfed him. How dare they not bow down to that image? But you see, they could not. Because Exodus 20 tells us this. Exodus 20 tells us, if you know your commandments, you shall bow down to no other gods. There's only one God. 
You shall not make any image of anything. So they knew their commandments, and they knew they could not do it. So then in verse 15, you hear this. Now when you hear, now the king is issuing orders again. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lighter, the harp, pipe, and all kinds of instruments. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And they now issue this decree. This, 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 this little thing is key to what we're going to be talking about here. The king then says, Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? He said, This is a challenge here. Speak to your God, pray to your God. Is he going to be able to save you? From my hand, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of all, what God will save you. And at that point, what would you say? Would you pray knowing that God can say yes or no? Or are you just going to go bow down? What are you going to do? And this is not the first time, by the way, that King Nebuchadnezzar threatened the lives of these guys. In chapter 2, we hear that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And then he wanted his dream interpreted. So he gathers up his wise men, which include Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and he tells them, interpret my dream. But here was a catch. He didn't tell them what the dream was. He just says, interpret my dream. And they're like, oh, king, nobody has ever done such a thing that you would interpret a dream that you have not told us. But the king was unrelenting. He's like, you're stalling for time. Tell me my dream. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pray to God. And God answered in chapter 2. Told him what the dream was. And told him the interpretation of their dream. But now they're in a similar scenario. Another challenge to pray. What God is going to serve you, to save you from my hand. But what follows is remarkable. And this is the crux of our sermon. So just listen from verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We know we shouldn't bow down to you. We don't even need to dignify it with an answer. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to rescue us or is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. So they do not doubt God's power. But 18 is key and crucial. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. Do you have faith? Do you have genuine faith that says, even if God does not answer that prayer, you will still continue to trust him? Even if that illness brings you to your grave, are you going to trust God? Even if you're destitute on the streets, are you going to continue to trust God? Even if you are persecuted for your faith and you would lose everything, that you will continue to trust God. 
even if. Will you trust God? That is true faith. That is faith in God that is not dependent on outcomes. It is dependent on the God whom you trust. So now you can say, even if God does not spare my child's life, I will continue to trust God. Even if God will not do anything for you, you will continue to trust God. And these young men were willing to perish then bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue. So I ask you, as the climate is changing, there was such a time when being a Christian or being associated with a Christian was a net positive. It could get you a job to be a Christian. And then we moved into a time where it was neutral. People went against Christians. But you know what? You just don't talk about it. That's your private thing. You have faith in Jesus. Oh, good for you. But now we're moving into a time where being a Christian is a net negative in society. It might cost you your job. It might cost you relationships. And in them times, are you going to continue to have faith? Faith in God. Job put it this way. In Job chapter 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. You know, though he slay me, though things would not go the way that I want them to go, though God does not answer the way that I want him to answer, I will praise him. And Habakkuk puts it this way. In Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Do you understand? For, for, for them in an ag agrarian society, to not have those things is to have nothing. And of course, you're praying to God that God will miraculously intervene. But Habakkuk is saying, even if God does not miraculously intervene, I will continue to trust in him. So does God have all the power? Yes. Is God able to deliver you from all your problems and trials? Yes. But does God deliver believers from all trials when they pray? No. As we've been learning from the book of James, there might be many other reasons why God does not deliver you from your trials. But in their moments, continue to trust in God. Never doubt his ability to miraculously intervene. But even if he does not, continue to trust him. And in Daniel 3 verse 24, as the story continues, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't these three, the one we tied up and threw into the fire? You see, what had happened after that, Nebuchadnezzar was furious and said, heat up the furnace seven times hotter, which is just, just bring it to its maximum. And he threw those three boys into that fire. But in this instant, God miraculously intervened. And in verse 25, they said, and he said, look, I see a fourth man walking around in the fire, unbounded and harmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. 
So one thing I need to, 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 to grasp from this is, in the fire, God was there. In the fiery trials, even when you're not delivered the way that you want to be delivered, you are not by yourself. God is with you. And in their moment, continue to praise God and trust Him. We've all heard about what faith is. I want to jump to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. That is faith. And then in that section, I'm going to read from you from verse 32. Just listen to the miraculous things that God has done to intervene and rescue people. After listing all these people, you know Abraham, Jacob, Joseph. There's just so many to mention. And then in 32 you read. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, about Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, as we are just reading, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses were turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others, and, and I want you to understand as we take this shift, that both people had faith. Those who were miraculously rescued and those we're going to read about, they are commended for their faith. There were others who were tort tortured, refusing to be released, that were my gate that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers, floggings, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They were about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes on the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I do not know what awaits you. I don't know what trials await you. When you pray, whether God miraculously intervenes or God does not miraculously intervene, true faith continues to trust in God. When you get to your moment of, I want you to get to this moment where you're like, even if God does not, I will trust in God. I want to take you to Luke chapter 22, where Jesus himself had an even if moment as well in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke 22. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you're willing, not doubting God's power, take this cup from me, but yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I'm not saying the trials are going to be easy. They're going to be hard. They're going to be tears. They're going to be pain. But we need to get to this point where Jesus is saying, God, even if you don't take away this cup away from me, I will continue to trust the plan that you have set forth, Father, 
for the rescuing of many people. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, you're investigating the Christian faith, look into Jesus, who willingly went to the cross and died, but continued to trust the plan of his Father. Trusted that when he's victorious, he'll be raised by the power of the Spirit, triumphant, and he'll be raised high, exalted. This is the God whom we are to trust. And saying that even if he does not answer the prayers the way we want them answered, we'll continue to trust him. During World War II, there was a theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor, well-known, wrote books, but he was living at the time of the Nazi regime, the time of Hitler, where many people stayed silent. He spoke up. And it's debated even to this time whether it's right or wrong, but in his reading of the Bible, he said, the evil that is going on right now is too much. So he got involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. It wasn't successful in the end. He was caught and he was put in prison. And he was executed just two days before that whole prison was liberated. And in one of his last writings, he says this. This is the end. But for me, the beginning of life. This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. You need to see these trials in a bigger picture. You need to see the bigger picture. And understand that because of what Jesus did on the cross, even if God were never to do a thing for you ever again in your life, he's already done enough. He's done enough on that cross to deserve your trust. Even if you're destitute on the streets, God has done enough on that cross. So brothers and sisters, I, I do pray for you that in times of trial, you will be found to have genuine faith. True faith that says, even if I will trust God. So what we're going to do now, we're going to do something a bit different. We're not going to sing as we normally do. I'm going to ask the tech team to play a video. It's a song that is based on Daniel 3, which is I Trust in God. It's a lyric video. It's just going to play. So as it plays, as you sit there, just reflect on those words of a God who will show up in your trials, of a God who will show up in your life, and of a God whom you can say with the psalmist, Psalm 34, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my trials. Ultimately, when we look at the cross, your biggest issue was sin. Sin. 